During the 1960s, amidst intense Cold War uh, tension and large-scale African decolonization, Congo Kinshasa was seen by U.S. decision makers as an important prize because of its size, its resources, its strategic location in Africa. U.S. policies in the 60s were shaped mainly by two distinct categories of upper class elites, outsiders to the government who came in mainly to the State Department and whose previous social and political experiences had, as I mentioned, taken place outside of the executive branch for the most part. One group under the Republican president Eisenhower was upper class, conservative, pro-European. The other under Democratic presidents Kennedy and Johnson was upper class, liberal, and sympathetic to at least moderate third world nationalism. These varying perspectives of the two, three administrations influenced the ways that each interpreted alleged communist threats, influenced the, the, their choices as to which Congolese politicians they favored, influenced the relative priorities they set for protecting Western European relations versus Afro-Asian country relations of the United States. Then by the 1980s, the second time period I want to look at, Zaire's importance, it was renamed by Mobutu Zaire, to American decision makers has significantly decreased. The number of independent African countries had mushroomed. Real world experience had diminished the fear of the communists taking over the Congo. So as a result of all that, US policy which had been set by the top decision makers before, was increasingly uh, consigned to lower levels of the US government, especially bureaucrats from the State Department's Africa Bureau. And that trend has persisted until this very day. Although there were somewhat different policy emphases under different presidents, uh, the Democrat Carter stressed human rights more, the Republican Reagan, you know, emphasize supporting friends like Mobutu, the head of the country, um, and Republican George H.W. Bush was president during the wave of democratization in Africa, but he still stopped short of casting off Mobutu. The key to me is the bottom line of all these administrations, all three of these administrations, was that the State Department bureaucracy was unwilling to risk its relationship with a decaying client regime, Mobutu regime, it was unwilling to re-examine its early 1960s judgment that the country would fall apart if the regime were disturbed, and therefore the U.S. was incapable of taking a long-term view of political stability in the Congo and effective government governance in the Congo. <clears throat> now, as we all know, uh, in the late 1990s, um, the regime decayed further under Mobutu and ultimately collapsed into regional and internal wars that killed at least three and a half million people. This only temporarily caused higher levels of the Clinton and George Bush administrations to take notice more of the Congo. They supported an African-led peacemaking process because the whole region was aflame, uh, but that included also democratic elections in the Congo. What about today? In this era, under, first let's look at Obama, Democratic president, um, then Republican Trump and Democratic Biden. Uh, the U.S. policy has resumed its low priority for U.S. policymakers, for the top policymakers. Both the Kabila and Chisichetti governments have mostly failed to make very significant progress toward effective democratic governance, at least so far. All three administrations, Obama, Trump, and Biden, did offer rhetorical support for various reforms. But the State Department Africa Bureau's risk-averse focus on short-term over long-term political stability has continued to hold sway. The bureaucracy does not want to take a chance on actually departing from support of the existing regime. 
Now, none of these American policies, as it turns out, really have advanced the long-term political stability and governance that are the official goals of US policy. In other words, the operational goals of the US have been in contradiction with its official goals.